Okay, so I guess we are live. Um, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Tobias Brinkman. I'm the head of the Jewish Studies program here at Penn State and teach modern Jewish history. And it's really a great honor uh, to uh, celebrate the publication of uh, Eliana Adler's book, which is the focus of this uh, session today. And I'm just going to give a short overview uh, how we uh, basically uh, uh, planned this. Um, and uh, I will introduce the individual uh, commentators and Eliana, uh, and then we get, get going in about uh, two or three minutes. Uh, so I just wanted to mention uh, that this event is recorded. So it'll be available on the Penn State Jewish Studies Facebook page on the YouTube channel that we just launched on, and on Instagram and Twitter. So you can find it there. Um, and I want to thank the history department for uh, supporting this event. Uh, and of course, Lior Sternfeld, who really is the, the one who made it all possible, the, the man in the background. Uh, let me uh, introduce the speakers. Uh, uh, the first uh, commentator is Professor Harvey Dreyfus. She, uh, is one of the leading specialists for the Holocaust uh, in uh, Eastern Europe. She is a professor at the history department at the University of Tel Aviv. Um, and she has uh, uh, spent a lot of time working at uh, Yad Vashem. Uh, uh, and um, she is the head of the Center for Research on Holocaust in Poland at the Inter International Institute for Holocaust Research uh, at Yad Vashem. Um, and so really one of the leading specialists uh, for that topic. Um, uh, Camille Kiek uh, is an assistant professor at the Jewish Studies uh, Department at the University of Wrocław in Poland. Um, he, his research is very interesting. So he really works on Jewish life and Jewish history in Poland. Uh, so I think he's one of the key specialists uh, uh, on Jewish history before, during, and after the Holocaust. So that's a really interesting uh, area. And uh, he has held uh, fellowships at the Center for Jewish History in New York and at the, Holo at the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. And he's published uh, already quite a bit about uh, uh, really Jewish history uh, in Poland. And uh, the final commentator is Anna Sternis. Uh, who is just now, uh, this is a great honor, a fellow at the, with the Guggenheim Foundation for this year. Uh, she holds the position of L. and Malka Green, Professor of Yiddish Studies uh, at the University of Toronto, where she also directs the N. Tenenbaum Center for Jewish Studies. Um, and uh, she, uh, she has published widely about uh, Jewish history in the Soviet Union, her first book was uh, covered uh, Jewish popular culture in the Soviet Union. Um, and she, her latest book uh, deals with uh, oral history of Jewish life during the Stalin period. She's also the co-editor of Eastern European Jewish Affairs, one of the main journals uh, in this field. And I, I really have to say this, uh, we are all in this field missing uh, David Schneer who passed away um, last week. Um, and uh, so he, he probably might have participated in this. Uh, so that, that's really a great loss uh, and a real shock, I think, for most of us. Um, maybe I leave it at that and introduce Eliana at the end. Uh, uh, and so each one of you uh, has 10 minutes. Uh, so I uh, hand it over to Javi uh, and I'll be in touch if you go over time. Uh, so about 10 minutes, that's pretty tough. So <laughs> uh, to make this work, thank you. Okay, I'll do my best that you won't have to remind me, but I cannot promise. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for having me. And uh, I would like to thank Eliana for writing such a wonderful group, an excellent and in-depth and thorough study, which along with many of its virtues, some of for sure will be detailed, is one of the most thought-provoking studies I have came across recently. And it is a wonderful book, uh, Eliana. Is the extensive documentation you used, the written and unwritten alike, as well as the wide geographical range enabled you and all of us to ask questions about history, memory, politics, and community, all which became part of this impressive discussion that you presented us. 
in order to write this work, work, you had to combine your knowledge about Holocaust studies and many other fields. And, and I guess you became an expert in the history of Soviet Union and World War II and Polish history and many other things which were had to be very challenging. So in fact, reading this book, Survival on the Margin, was for me similar to, to the experience of looking at this map. Wait a second. At this map. Meaning, I'm sorry for the quality, meaning things look familiar and some even were known, but they suddenly seem completely different. Suddenly, suddenly I had to look at them and read, it, read them in a very different way. So you challenge the border and the definition of the history of the Holocaust, as well as many other fields, and forced us, or at least forced me to look beyond what they, I usually do when I deal with Holocaust studies. And actually this is part of something that is happening in the last few years, because we can find a few works that were challenging the definition of the field of Holocaust research. Uh, Timothy Schneider, for example, asked uh, questions about a different geographical basis. Other question if specific events as death march or as local histories are part of this topic of Holocaust research. And what you did in a totally different way in this book forced us in the most positive sense to ask again, what are we researching? What is the center? And what are the margins of the topics that we are trying to deal with? And apparently you examined the fate of some of 150,000 Polish Jewish refugees in wartime Soviet Union. But in fact, we do much more. You demand us to treat the Holocaust of Polish juries on the basis of a vision that it contained one united community, part of it under German occupation and part of it that uh, fled to the Eastern parts and later on deported to the Eastern parts. That means actually you showed us that we should refer to the Yiddish folk in Poland, in Poland and not to refer to only to the Jews under German occupation. And this of course, at least made me ask new questions or at least look at things in a different way. Um, you managed to combine many different narratives of Polish Jews, non-Jewish non Poles, resident of central Poland, resident of the Kresi, Soviet authorities, and many others. And dear Eliana, this is a most impressive uh, study. And I really want to thank you for that. I can tell you, I already gave my students to read the uh, uh, small segments of it. Demanding to refer to the true Jewish public in Poland as one communities whose fate was varied during the war and not only under Nazi occupation is, practically, is particularly challenging because it contains an inbuilt imbalance. On the one hand, the numbers of the survivors are much more of those who fled or were deported to the East. On the other hand, from the very beginning, they were in much small, small numbers. In the same way, they, their part in the general history of uh, the Jews was much more narrow than you just showed us as it should be. Now, the main question that I was trying to do reading you, the main question that I was asking myself reading this research was actually a double question. And I was trying to ask, what can we learn from those refugees about the Holocaust? And what can we learn about the Holocaust from those ref refugees? And actually you gave a very detailed answer to the question about what we can learn from the refugees about the Holocaust. You referred in a very original and interesting way, the question of Polish Jewish relations and the, the question of the Jewish reorganization. Uh, for example, uh, you referred to many, sorry, I just missed myself. Um, wait a second. Um, you showed how in this uh, chaotic reality, uh, people in the Eastern parts also had to deal with the very difficult term of choiceless choices, of uh, having to get to, to accept different choices and not knowing what will be their final implication, stay or leave, accept Soviet citizen or not, uh, stay in the camps to which they were deported or leave to other cities. So it's not, it wasn't a question of right or wrong, but this term of choiceless choices is true not only for Jews 
Polish Jews who are under Nazi occupation, but for Jews in other places as well. In the same way, you challenge the question of refugees, of, of people who find themselves in a completely different uh, reality. And actually you showed us how devastating this, um, this experience of refugees was. At the same time, you refer to some aspects which usually we don't refer to them enough in Holocaust studies. And whoever read your book can see how you integrate the story of Orthodox Judaism, the, uh, how you try to, to refer to sexual abuses and many other questions which we in Holocaust research don't give enough place many times. So there is no doubt that this study contributes significantly to a better understanding of what happened in the German occupied territories to this Yiddish folk, and not only a better understanding of Jew, those Jews who were deported. But I also try to ask what can we learn from the Holocaust re re research about those refugees? And I try to ask myself a few questions, mainly trying to concentrate on those Jews who were on the way to flee to the east, to the east, or by accident, uh, accidental reasons, were forced to stay on the way, and finally found themselves under Nazi occupation. And I tried to ask myself what happened to them because actually they were supposed to be part of your story, but some somehow became stuck in Nazi Germany. And looking at them, I asked myself a few questions because some of them uh, became very important part in the communities to which they were deported or to which they fled to. For example, and some of them had a great influence on those communities. Uh, I can think of young Torah scholars who became central in uh, enlarging the, the religious studies in a specific community. I can give example of uh, different people who later on became part of the Judenrat, although they were refugees in the Kresi and so others. And one of the things I was asking myself is, can we try to draw any similarities between the community, this one Jewish community that you refer to, that found itself under Nazi occupation and in the Soviet uh, zone, especially when we're talking about, for example, the reorganization of those communities. Much was written about the way that the Jewish society tried to rebuild its cultural, its, its uh, educational, its political life in different ghettos and even outside of those ghettos, even before they were established. I was trying to ask myself, can you point out similar or different patterns of those groups, because one of the very interesting chapters you have in your book, chapter four, you are showing how in those Eastern parts, those Jews also try to organize themselves in different communities and try to preserve something from this uh, Yiddish folk that was uh, lost during the war. Um, another question that I wanted to ask you, and that is, on the one hand, you deal very nicely with the different aspects of Polish-Jewish relationship, but when we talk, especially uh, in, the in the last few years about Polish-Jewish relationship, many times we say that the uh, Polish government exile didn't see the Polish Jews under Nazi occupation zone as part of the secret state, so-called. And you portrayed something that is much more complicated regarding what is happening to the East. It's not such a black and white uh, picture. And I wondered if you could refer to that a little bit more. But at the bottom line, this study creates an important connection between the different parts of what you call this uh, Jewish people of Poland. And one of the sad things, of course, is to notice how you describe that if those Jews who stayed under Nazi Germany later on were mostly killed, and of course the communities were shattered, but even those Jews who tried to preserve something from what was left behind, it was very, very challenging for, for them. So in the bottom line, I would like to ask if those Jews who were deported or fled to the East also found themselves at the end of the war, standing in front of something that they could not uh, rebuild again. And that is this notion of this Yiddish folk. Um, I have one more minute, so I will just end and thank you again, Eliana, for such a thought-provoking book that challenged our, our knowledge and understanding. 
And this is exactly what one wants from such a book as yours, The Survival on the uh, Margins. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, we have a problem with the interpreter. So the participants cannot see them. Uh, so I don't know, uh, Lior, can you can we take a short break here for a few seconds? Uh, because I do not know how to change that. Uh, they, they cannot enter the gallery view, so they cannot see the interpreters. Tobias, it's because you have to change settings on your end, you know, if you're the host of this meeting. Uh, I'm the co-host, so I have, I have no clue how to do you this. Know, if you know which setting I should change, I'm, I'm trying frantically to. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. So you have to go to preferences on Zoom, and then you choose, uh, Hold on a second. Uh, um, I think it's in the general somewhere, but I'm looking here. I should have looked at it uh, earlier, but I was listening to Javi. So uh, just give me a second too, and you keep looking like it's somewhere in those settings, allowing the view. We apologize for yeah, this. Yeah, we're sorry. Oh, display up to 49 in gallery view. Maybe that's it. Do, do that. Gallery view will be better. Share screen, maybe that's it. No, no, share screen. Oh, no, share no, 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 don't share screen. No, no, I'm not doing it. Are you now on speaker view or on gallery view? Oh, you know what? That's a special webinar thing that I don't have uh, uh, settings for, but in the webinar, you can, uh, you can change the setting, what people can see, like it's less restrictive. You can make it less restrictive so they can change the view. Yeah, but I, I think that just clicking on the interpreter solves the problem because then we can pin his video and see the interpreter like on a main screen. Because I did it now, pressing on the interpreter, I, I can see him as interpreting right now. But then, but then people won't see speakers. Uh, oh, yeah, but at least, you know. Okay. Can we? Wait a second. Maybe now, can everybody see both of the interpreters? Apparently not. Nope, not yet. Um, you know, you can also enable the closed captioning of uh, the meeting. Do you know how to do that? Um, yeah. As a, as a backup. Yeah, yeah. That that you go to. Oh, if you know, then you know. It's in advanced. Oh, I, I, yeah, in the setting in in meeting. Yeah. But then you'll have to restart the meeting, which will probably be too much trouble. Everybody. Maybe, uh, maybe the sandwich interpreters can can unmute themselves, so then they can. I'm not sure that will be helpful, but we can try to unmute them as well. Mm. Um, I'll ask the audience if they can see now. If you can indicate in the Q&A box, that you can see. Yeah, Prendy. Let's see. So Gary says he can only see Lior who's speaking. Maybe we can, we can only, if there will be only one host or co-host, I don't need to be any more co-host or anything. And then uh, whatever you will be find will be what we will see. So maybe you can take back uh, and return to be only one host and then your screen will be the one that will determine the definition. Well, maybe the person could become a panelist, no? Because I can switch around all the views. Yes, that's the solution, Lior. Oh, that's an yeah, I, I added uh, Gary. Good. Oh, so maybe Gary will join us and then uh, 
we will be able to play with the settings like we do. And if there's anybody else who also needs that. It kind of is a is a, the same kind of narrative as normally when we do in person. Somebody says, my microphone doesn't, I, we can't hear you. We can't hear. So this is the moment when there's a doctor in the house who can fix that microphone. And uh, we can hear you. is it better now? Here we go. Hi, Gary. Okay, Gary's in. All right. But does anyone else need to be able to see also? Uh, let's see. He was the only one. Yes. Another one. Uh, oh. Yes, we can see everyone now. Okay. Oh, now it's All working. Right. Oh, whew. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank Good. you. Good. Okay, great. We move on. Uh, so I hand it over to Camille uh, for about 10 minutes. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for your patience. Uh, yes, thank you. I will try to be very short. And first of all, I want all you, all, all of you to really to encourage you to read this uh, fascinating uh, book. And I wanted to turn uh, everyone's attention on a thing that usually when we discuss or promote historical books, especially we professional historians, we tend to focus on novelty, on unknown facts that the book presents, et cetera, et cetera. And this book does it, but um, it does much more because it uh, brings our attention on, on a second very important element of historical endeavor that we tend to forget, that is the empathy. The uh, ability that this book gives of understanding our historical protagonists, heroes of our historical research in a particular time and place, in a time when they did not knew what will happen later or what is happening uh, uh, in other places. Now, this is very important because especially in 20th century history, maybe especially, but in all histories actually, there is a tension between this empathic dimension and the uh, te te teleological character of most of the historical research. That usually when we explain the facts, how the facts go one from another, how one thing stems from another, we use the we use the benefit of that of the thing that we know what would happen later, and this uh, has not only the I would say methodological but also some moral uh, implications, especially for Polish, Russian, Eastern European 20th century, and for the history uh, of the Holocaust, uh, because also it affects the public discourse and the popular understanding of how the things happen and. That is the reason why we usually, for example, tend to think about, let's say, uh, Jewish immigrants from Poland to Palestine in 1920s or to the United States before the First World War are somehow wiser or, you know, foretelling what, what happened in, in comparison to the people who emigrated in the 1930s. People who emigrated in the 1930s, they were wiser than those people who survived the Holocaust and immigrated just after the Holocaust. People who emigrated from from 1956 were less wise than the people who emigrated uh, just after. The same actually you have in Soviet Jewish history. And, and as I say, not only among historians, but among the families of protagonists of the historical story, when you know, uh, people who made Aliyah from Soviet Union in the 70s are these wiser people, yes? people who understood history better than the people uh, who emigrated in the 1990s. And uh, this, I would say, empathical um, approach used in this book, the very wise and very intelligent reading of the personal stories kind of deconstructs this notion and really helps us to really understand how, how, how people did not know uh, making decision of whether to flee to the border in 1939 what to do during the evacuation in 1941, what kind of decision to take in 1945 and, and 1946. And Eliana's books exactly enables us to understand these people in a particular um, uh, time and uh, place. And uh, another value of this, um, um, of this study, and my two questions stem from this empathic dimension, the second value, is that Eliana's study actually goes to the, uh, historical specialization, that that's what exactly what Javi said. Uh, not only geographically, but also period-wise. We usually have a historiography, special, a historiography specializing in interwar period, 
in Holocaust and then in post-Holocaust, post-war period. Now, a study of Eliana cuts through all these uh, periods, also very wisely using the personal material. And I have two questions regarding it that would allow us to understand even deeper implications of this book and go even beyond the content of the book, like to think how this book can understand, uh, can make us understand even more general patterns of Jewish, Eastern European Jewish history in 20th century. First is the question of what I, I would call intellectual Jewish departure from Eastern Europe. Meaning that as we know demographically, the, the big wave of Jewish emigration from Eastern Europe starts from the end of the 19th century. And then from the first Russian revolution and especially from the first world war and the Bolshevik revolution, we, we see it also intellectual level that many diasporists, many people committed really to building Jewish national identity and Jewish life in diaspora start to depart from idea, thinking that there is a time for a new centers of uh, Jewish civilization. I could mention Joshua Harlib's book, Tragedy of the Generation, or the book that will come out very shortly of Kenneth Moss, uh, Unchosen, about the Polish, in, uh, Polish Jewish uh, intellectual thought of 1930s, and this you know, growing departure from Eastern Europe. Uh, and then of course, Holocaust and Holocaust aftermath and the communists in Eastern Europe only strengthens this uh, notion. So actually, Liana, my first question is, could you on the basis of very wide material that you read, analyze, and especially that your material goes biographically from interwar period up to the post Holocaust, could you really observe this process, how your protagonists, how people that you research, how the, uh, in their minds, idea that Eastern Europe is not the place for them as a Jews kind of grows and develops. And the second question is also concerning these periods, interwar, Holocaust, and, up, uh, and um, Holocaust aftermath, that uh, as we all know, in 1930s in Eastern Europe, radical ideologies uh, dominate the, I would say, dominate Jewish thinking, especially dominate the thinking of the generations of the youngest people who are young in 1930s, and these are exactly the people that you described. Now, we know from the um, Tony Jatz and other studies of post-war that post-war also is the time of kind of going collective, going, going away of this radical, you know, from this uh, radical ideology in, into, you know, categories of liberal rights, social and individual ones of this, you know, post-ideological politics. And uh, I wanted to ask you, in what, in your opinion, the Soviet experience, the experience of the ultimately modernist state of this, you know, 1930s mode, how much it influenced and changed the way of thinking about the politics and society of these Polish Jews that you research? Thank you, and once again, I really congratulate you. Wonderful study that you have. Thank you, Camille. This was really interesting. Um, so I pass it on to Anna. Um, Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tobias, and uh, thanks to Javi and to Camille. Um, I agree with both of my colleagues to say that this was uh, this is a wonderful book. And uh, um, what struck me most about it, I would say, is uh, not just how it's well written and the stories are so compelling, and uh, this whole kind of theme of uh, Polish Jews. Uh, uh, going east um, for the first time really elaborated in detail in a full form of a book and uh, you know like it's uh, important to stop and think about the fact how uh, the majority of Polish Jews who survived the war did so in the Soviet Union and this uh, monograph comes out in 2020 and uh, it is the first uh, book length study of these stories. And this whole idea of obscurity of how stories are hidden and obscure, it's not that people didn't talk about this, it's just somehow we didn't listen. And, uh, you know, there is a astonishing number of sources that Eliana uses, memoirs written as early as 1947, uh, written in Yiddish, in Hebrew, some are in English. There are also memoirs written in Polish and in Russian. Like, you know, like there are people did not keep silent about their experiences. But even scholarship of their stories is somehow 
is obscured. Eliana cites uh, uh, an Israeli scholar, Yosef Likvak, who wrote a book about, um, uh, you know, about uh, re uh, repatriation or exile of Polish Jews to the Soviet Union. He published it in Hebrew in 1988. The book has never been translated into English with the exception of short chapter in uh, uh, a volume called Bitter Legacy edited by Tzvi Gilman in the early 90s. And, uh, you know, that book was, is an uh, excellent Litvak's book and uh, it dealt with a lot of archival documents, but it, it didn't have people in it. It was all about about policies. And um, as I was reading through the book, I thought that it had to, these memoirs, those stories, needed Eliana to tell their stories in such a way that finally they get to a larger audience, to the audience of readers of this book, but books, but also, as Javi said, audience of uh, university students. And above all, I think, the audience of descendants of people who lived through these experiences. Even now in Q&A, uh, aside from technical issues, uh, questions, there is already a question about whether or not Eliana used Yisker Beher for tracing the destinations. And I understand where this question is coming from because people want to know what happened to the, their families three or four generations ago. And uh, sadly today, this book and some of those published memoirs are the only way to find out because that generation um, is uh, mostly no longer with us. So it's um, the book is in so many ways is performing both uh, an exciting, innovative academic research, um, providing us uh, with trajectories, with uh, uh, stories of Soviet occupation decisions, as Havi said, Havi said earlier, choice list choices situation, surviving under the Soviet rule, um, being deported, uh, life in the Soviet rear, and then finally return. And return is an interesting word here because it's not exactly a return to the same place, it's return to a new prison and all this. So that story is, there. But it's also um, kind of bringing the voices out of obscurity. It's also bringing to light some of the uh, stories and some of the historical events that have not been studied before. And it's not clear exactly why. For example, we all know, or we all heard that a lot of Polish Jews were arrested by Stalin's government and sent to jails in uh, located in the Soviet rear in Siberia and Kazakhstan, parts of uh, uh, close to Ural Mountains. But what were they doing in those jails? Anyone ever asked the question like, what was like for them to actually be in those barracks, to work on cutting trees, deal with like all sorts of things? Where did kids live? Uh, and Eliana is addressing that. That's the first monograph that actually addresses Polish Jews in Soviet Gulag. Um, memoirs wrote about this very little, but of course, um, one of the big challenges uh, of studying memoirs and oral histories for what it's worth is that People don't talk about things that can be too painful to discuss. And um, one of those uh, interesting, one of those important uh, issues, and Eliana addresses them a lot, uh, you know, significantly in the book, is the issue of silences and secrets. And what are the things that, because a lot of painful experiences make it, uh, and historians are terrible to memoirists and oral history, uh, you know, people who give oral histories, they start, we have to be careful, we don't have to trust, we have to verify. Like, honestly, like, it's, uh, it's unbelievable to what extent judges and lawyers trust oral testimonies <laughs> to the same extent that historians distrust them, but that's a whole the subject for the whole un, uh, other rant. But what's interesting to me is, um, you know, where are the things that they don't talk about? Eliana brings up a topic of sexual violence. Again, one of the overlooked, understudied topics. Now it's coming back to the Holocaust studies. Nobody's talking about this in the context of the Soviet Union. And it takes a lot of uh, looking to find where people are talking, what happened to their friends, how they dealt with stigmas of others, and how this uh, was on the background. Another issue that did not make it to the book, and I'm sure it's because it was not in memoirs, is sexual violence against men. Uh, sexual violence against women is somehow discussed that sexual violence against men, which we know was a huge issue in Soviet gulags, you know, people don't discuss that. And uh, to me, this idea of uh, secrets and the idea of silences and the ideas of, you know, 
forgetting the story that was so central just because it doesn't make into sources uh, or historians don't know how to study it is a, a huge problem. And I think this book does a, does a beautiful job of addressing that and uh, bringing it to our attention. There are also things that, uh, you know, perhaps pick out attention more now that, uh, uh, you know, Alana spends considerable time uh, talking about diseases and climate, you know, how they dealt with epidemics of typhus and cholera and typhoid fever, how they dealt with all this in the conditions of cold, with no medication, with no doctors, with no politicians, uh, you know, organizing quarantines and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, something that we don't often pay attention to, but, you know, that's what people are talking about. And today, reading this book, it has a stark sense of recognition. What were they doing to, you know, control a disease and, and to survive in conditions that uh, they were? What I also liked and found really interesting about the book, how uh, there are so many names in it and you know, appreciated names of men and women, uh, people whose only publication was a book of memoir or people who built their careers as writers and historians. In fact, there are so many uh, you know, names that we recognize from Jewish studies, you know, who survived the war in the Soviet Union, Honia Shmerek, Moshe Grossman, Euda Bauer, David Azrieli. Well, David Azrieli is a Canadian and philanthropist, so, uh, you know, I recognized his name uh, that way. Mordechai Altshuler, you know, the composer Weinberg, I mean, I go on and on and on. So it's interesting to me how, uh, well, there's also Benjamin Harshaf, I didn't see his name, but maybe I missed it. Uh, you know, there's also, I missed it, right, uh, and then, um, you know, there's this historian Papernik, whose name is uh, mentioned a lot in Save the Deportation. So it was interesting to me how many of those people were extremely productive in their lives. They've written tons of uh, works on uh, modern Jewish history, sometimes even history of the Holocaust, very rarely addressing that Soviet experience. And and it's part of their biographies, but it's not part of their scholarship. And um, uh, I will come to questions in a minute. I have some uh, uh, relating to that. The last thing that I wanted to say about as a token, my appreciation for the book, is um, I really enjoyed um, elements that of uh, bringing up a little bit of life culture to it. It's like there are jokes, there's a little bit of folklore and some songs. Well, I am extremely biased in finding those materials really interesting, but to me, they really brought life to um, these narratives. So, you know, there is this joke uh, about uh, a person experiencing uh, living under the Soviet occupation in Ukraine and they goes to a store and uh, it's in a book on page 73 uh, and says, uh, and buys shoes and then kisses the shoes. And people are saying to him, why do you kiss those shoes? And he says, well, if you lived under the Bolsheviks for 20 years, you would also kiss those shoes. So, you know, like stuff like that, very rare. And nobody would like find a joke now. It probably didn't survive in oral histories, but it is in the book or a, jo a joke about the DP camp, about the status of Adam and Eve, that they are, of course, displaced people who have no clothes, nothing to eat but an apple and think that they live in paradise. So um, elements of, uh, so elements of culture from the time, but also above all, voices of people who lived through this experience um, on obscured or uh, not hidden from the reader, but uh, are there front and center with insightful interpretation. So um, I found that very uh, interesting to read and also it was very easy read an academic book, uh, uh, you know, uh, often takes a while to read, but you know, this one just, uh, you want to know what happened, it reads very easily. So some of the questions that I thought about to ask uh, for discussion, so, um, I'm curious about those silences, uh, you know, and talk a little bit more about them. Uh, I also want to know if, Eliana, you think that there is a correlation why people who went for those experiences, uh, I don't know, so many of them became historians. Is it because they learned all these languages, uh, you know, Russian, Polish? I remember how Harshav gave this talk and said, everyone says I'm a cosmopolitan. Well, Stalin and Hitler schlepped me around the world. So yeah, of course I'm cosmopolitan. So, you know, and then, or maybe it's experience of gulag. Some of your uh, materials are talking about how the prison was a school of life 
for them. So it's a little bit of a cliche statement for memoirs, but perhaps it's also a way um, that people could relate to different histories of violence and, and uh, abuse and uh, you know and historical events and, and made them more interested in writing history. So I'm curious what you think about that. Um, I was also fascinated by uh, a chapter which spoke about Jewish relations. Um, the refugees relationship to the local population, especially stories of marriages to local women. And, you know, there are so like, <laughs> that's not a tabooized story and completely uh, under research, but there are so many consequences to this to you. I don't know if you, everyone know here in the name of the Russian politician, Vladimir Zhirinovsky, whose father was a Polish Jewish refugee uh, in Kazakhstan. And, you know, he left uh, before the war, left his mom there. And now Vladimir Zhirinovsky is one of the far right extremist Russian politicians, you know, but you know, I'm just bringing it up because that's part of contemporary Russian culture. So this relationship with those locals, I think is very interesting uh, to think about. And um, my final question is the, the curiosity about the relationship in those DP camps between Polish Jews who survived the war in the Soviet Union with those who survived the war in concentration camps. Uh, because today there is, especially like when there were more of them like 20 years ago, there was a lot of tension, comparative suffering, you know, even the status of the Holocaust survivor and stuff like this. So I'm curious what was going on in camps and a few memoirs are talking about that. So with that, I will finish my remarks. And once again, thank you for those of you who are listening and didn't buy that book. The book I strongly recommend it. And uh, thank you, Liana, for uh, and uh, everyone for giving me an opportunity to speak here as well. Thank you so much, Anna, for your comments. Uh, now it is my great honor to introduce the author. Uh, Eliana Adler is uh, my colleague here at Penn State. Uh, she, as you have probably figured out by now, is a social historian of Jewish life in Eastern Europe uh, uh, with particular interest in the history of education, religion, gender studies, Holocaust historiography, and memory. Uh, I would like to mention her first book, uh, In Her Hands, The Education of Jewish Girls in Tsarist Russia, published in 2011. That may also be of interest for some uh, of the participants today. And she is now, and this came up in the comments, uh, she's actually working on a new, I think, very exciting project that connects to this uh, book we are talking about today, namely a, a history of these Yisker books, these memory books, uh, which is also a, a huge gap uh, in the scholarship. Um, and so, uh, Iliana, you have about 10 to 15 minutes, uh, and then we're going to open it up, and I'm going to collect questions here and uh, uh, share them with you. So the floor is yours, Iliana. Okay. Thank you so much, um, all of you, everyone, really. Um, it's, as you know, it, it's a big project process, writing a book and you send it out there and you don't know where it goes, what it does. So it's, it's wonderful to have people actually read it and think about it a little and be able to have a conversation. I'm so appreciative. Um, and also to Lior and Tobias for helping make this happen, to my colleagues, my friends, my family, people who've been wondering what it is I've been working on for a full decade of my life. Um, and so now you're, I hope, getting some idea. I wanna talk just a little bit about the genesis of the book, and then I would love to engage with some of these questions. I will not be able to get to all of them, but I hope this is the beginning of a longer conversation. Uh, so this book was originally, it was a um, sort of a diversion. That is, I had finished my, Book on the history of education uh, in Tsarist Russia. I was going to do another book on a related topic. And a friend of mine suggested, it's nice after you finish a book just to do something a little different. So I got this fellowship at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. I was going to write an article about schools, clandestine schools for Jews in um, Central Asia during the war. And I went there and I started doing research. And um, to make a long story short, I discovered, first of all, that clandestine schools don't leave a lot of paperwork behind them. And secondly, that there wasn't secondary literature. I, I wanted to tell this little story and put it in a larger story, but I couldn't find the material to do that. And so my project kept expanding. Oh, okay, I have to explain how they got to Kazakhstan. Okay, fine. 
oh, but why would they have wanted to go there? What, because they were in a labor camp, but why were they in a labor camp? They're Polish Jews, why were they in the Soviet Union? And it just kept getting bigger and bigger. And I found myself gradually not planning this, coming to write a book that I did not, that really no one could have the expertise to write. It's too big. There's too many parts of it. There's too many fields that are um, too much geography. I, I'm, it, it's been a wonderful challenge. I've loved doing it, but I have also very much had to rely heavily on the research of others, on the expertise of others. Um, some of you here and many of my other colleagues and friends around the world. Um, and I, I see this book as a definitely a step and I hope it makes it possible for other people to do that more micro work that I originally set out to do. I hope that there's a lot more to know here about every aspect of this project. And I'm looking forward to seeing how um, people move forward into all of the different fields that it is related to. So um, in terms of these marvelous questions, I, I hardly know where to begin. Um, so I, a couple things, I guess, I'll go backwards. Um, Anna, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up uh, testimonies because um, your work is, I looked to a lot of people um, and you among them. When I, when I started this project again, yet another um, way that we change, our projects change us along the way, I, I thought I was gonna find a lot of new archival material. And I did find some, but in the end, first of all, it, it wasn't that interesting. The security service, the NKVD files are still not available even they might not be that interesting in the end. It, but the testimonies, the voices of the people turned out to be so compelling and so powerful and to push me, as you all pointed out, to change you know, my own uh, assumptions about borders, um, chronological, geographical, and otherwise national um, in approaching these people and to also delve into this field of of testimonies and how they're read, which has also been just wonderful. And I hope that I'm also making some contributions toward that field. Um, and um, there, are, there are certainly silences in those documents, um, so many of them. And something that I, I had to leave out a whole chapter, of the book, um, which I hope to keep working on. But I'm also very aware that when they were written and where they were written makes such a difference. And um, there's some fiercely anti-communist uh, writing in the 50s. There's some much more kind of rose-colored glasses writing in the 90s in, in the United States and in Australia, these you know well-off, comfortable people looking back. Um, so that also changes what they're silent about it and what they're not, I think. I did have one text that actually talked about sexual violence against a man, but then I lost it. I, I mean, I, I couldn't find it in my notes. One of these, I looked and looked and looked and looked and I, I couldn't find it again. Um, that was there. Um, but the, the, the value, I guess, in those um, the way that the different time periods affect what people talk about and what they don't is that it means that there are some areas that are available to us more so, like right after the war when there's more writing about, um, about violence in getting back to Poland, for example, um, and about fear there. And that seems to get somewhat dissipated over the years. That, that isn't as much discussed later. And so some of these silences are so, sort of to use, um, to use Hannah Poling Galai's term, they're about the ecologies of memory. And um, I, I think we can use them to, to work uh, with and against to some degree one another. Um, you also asked about the consequences of these refugees, sort of what they brought back with them and what they left behind. 
And that's something I've been thinking a lot about. Um, and it's, it's all very speculative, right? We can't uh, ever, you know, I, I hint in the book that um, they may have left behind them some access to traditional Jewish culture, but I can't prove that. I can't show that really. Nobody says that precisely. Um, and no one could have said that really. But it is certainly very intriguing and, um, and worth thinking about it. And maybe that's the sort of thing that people can take further. And, and the DP camps um, interrelations, personally, and this again, there's, there's people working on DP camps and doing more work here, but I generally saw a great deal of cooperation toward a common goal, that common goal being to rebuild Jewish life, to have families, they married one, one another, and memory. They wanted the exact same thing in terms of memory. They had these communities. They wanted to talk about them. They wanted to collect photographs about them and stories about them. And there wasn't, there didn't need to be a competition in that at that stage. Maybe at a later stage, there, it did develop. Maybe it had to. Um, but but I see a lot of unanimity in the DP camps. Um, and. Kamil, I want to um, I want to look at some of these excellent questions, and I also just want to thank you personally for pushing me. Um, and this is something that um, you all brought up a little bit, also um, not to sort of accept the foregone conclusions of what happened, um, but particularly about post-war Poland that that you really reminded me on several occasions that just because the majority of returnees from the Soviet Union turned out leaving didn't mean that they had to leave. It didn't mean that they knew they were leaving when they got back, that many of them really did stay for a while, you know, a few years, 10 years, 20 years in some cases, and try to rebuild and try to live where they knew, where, where they recognized, where they wanted to go back. And so I appreciate your helping me to, to see that and to recognize that in their texts, even though particularly because so many of the testimonies were um, taken in Western countries, that's the narrative that they present. So it, it has to be read against a lot of those texts to a great degree. In terms of your questions, um, it, a very interesting point about whether they're sort of changing their own idea about Poland while they're away and I did not see that that was the case. Uh, that um, a lot of them, and, and this is particularly the case from the testimonies that are taken during the war, are just desperate to get back to Poland. That's all they want. They, they see it as still a thriving place where they're, if not welcome, at least it's their home. And that's still what they're thinking about and talking about when they board the trains and when they go back uh, of course, there are Zionists, and they, from the beginning, the Zionists, they wish they'd left earlier, they, they were just waiting to get to Palestine, um, but that's not the majority voice from what, from what I saw. They're not, overall, I don't think they're quite changing yet their, their thoughts about that. Um, the sort of Gradual, gradual move away from radical ideologies is also a really interesting question. And um, one of my daughters is working on a senior thesis about this right now, but in the US. Um, and um, I, I need to think about that more. I, I don't, I, I mean, it's a, it's a great point. And, and certainly they do write about the effects of, of the Soviet experience on them but the majority of them didn't go into the Soviet experience with sort of open arms. They, they didn't, it's not that they expected that they would love living in a communist country. So I'm not sure if it is so much a turn away from that. There are some who express that, but even when they express it, sometimes it's in those very anti-communist texts where it feels a little cartoonish that they need to show that they, um, that they made that intellectual shift. Um, but I'm, I'm going to continue to think about that. 
And um, let me now get to Javi's questions, or at least some of them. Um, all of these wonderful questions. Um, but the, the big one about sort of the, the bi-directionality, what do we learn from juxtaposing these different historiographies together about these survivors and about the Holocaust and how they reflect on one another, I think really is one of the big questions of this work and something that I tried to touch upon um, in the conclusion in particular, but um, it's a really important question. So the, I mean, the simplest answer is, is that from the perspective of historiography, I, I certainly couldn't have written this book without the Holocaust there, all of the work on testimonies, so much of the work about the Germans and what they brought, you know, all of that I needed to rely upon. And there's so much and it's so well done. And, you know, in terms of also the, the post-war Polish setting, all, all of that has been, you know, I was able to rely on a lot of wonderful, excellent secondary work, um, which is all sort of related to the Holocaust. Um, and I hope also to contribute to those conversations. That, that was part of the point is to say that they're, I mean, as you point out, that they are in many ways the same conversation. Um, And uh, the question about sort of parallel patterns in terms of community formation during the war and potentially after the war also, I think you're also hinting at is, um, is a great question, which again, I, I think I need to think more about, but certainly the, you know, the, the sort of pool of Polish Jews on either side is identical. They're the same people. Um, so it makes sense that they would create the same types of communities and have, you know, put emphasis on some of the same cultural references. I mean, just to give one example, um, when I was looking for images for the book, there's a lot of pictures of people with gravestones. That's that doesn't happen in every culture, right? That's something Polish Jewish that people stood around the graves of their relatives who died in the Soviet Union and then they got back to Poland and did the same thing. They took family pictures in cemeteries or in memorial spots. Um, so there are certainly other ways also that, um, that those same cultural processes get shared across the space, um, although maybe they develop in different ways. So um, thank you all again. I don't know if we have time for a few questions. I'll see what Tobias says. Yeah, I think we uh, we lost a little time with the, uh, um, so I think I would say we can at least, at least do 10 to 15 minutes. Um, so please uh, just post the questions through the chat function and then I can uh, coordinate it. So I don't see anything right now, but it's probably going to take a while for people to type it. Um, ah, okay. Okay, something is there. Is there is a question about the ISCO book, which uh, Liana for sure can address. Uh, um, so it was something. Yeah, there was a question earlier about the ISCO books. How many did you use? I think that's really a good question, uh, just to get us started. As I look at all the questions that are coming on right now. Okay. But did you use them to trace the migrations, Isker Bucher? That was the exact question. Uh -huh. um, yes, uh, so uh, not in such a systematic way is the short answer. I, I use the Isker Bucher for, um, and, and that's memorial books, sorry, um, for those, uh, that's a Yiddish word for memorial books um, that were produced after the war. Um, I used them for stories, for testimonies. There's a lot of testimonies there of people who won't, you know, never publish anything, won't ever publish anything. They, that was something so important to them that they would write there, even though they don't think of themselves as writers. Uh, um, but I, I didn't use them in a systematic way or statistical way to try and see how many and who went where and that, that sort of thing. But there are just 
marvelous, marvelous stories available in those Yisker Bichar. Some of them have been um, translated um, and are on, available online and um, some of them not yet, but there is much more of that going on. Uh, there was one really general question I think that would be important to answer uh, just about the numbers. I think that's a really uh, important question, uh, especially for those who are not really specialists. I think you could say something about that. Yeah, this is a question that has been plaguing me. Um, um, and it's a fair question. It's a good question, but it is really such a hard one because um, we're essentially we're talking about flight. That is people as the German armies move into half of Poland and the Soviet army moves into the other half of Poland, people fleeing across what isn't yet a border. Um, there aren't people, there's nobody's counting how many of them. And it makes it very hard to tell how many of them there were. And um, the, the Polish government in exile during the war uh, thought that the numbers were really extremely high. Um, and gradually since then, they, they've been going down and down and down, those people who work really assiduously on numbers. And I'm not one of them. I rely on other people to do that kind of analysis. But I can say, broadly speaking, that um, possibly 300,000 or so Polish Jews fled, chose to cross the border from the Western to the Eastern part of Poland. And then somewhere around 100,000 of them, slightly less, were um, deported and ended up in the Soviet interior. And then some other number of them self-deported or um, evacuated once the German armies moved into the Soviet territory. And so they also ended up deep in the Soviet Union. And therefore, when the repatriation happened at after the end of the war in 1946, it was more, um, there were more than 100,000 of them. They had, they had multiplied because more Polish Jews ended up among them. Um, and of course, there's some who stayed also, as Anna was pointing out. So that also makes it so hard to tell. And then there's another repatriation later, a smaller one, which is only about 15,000, 18,000. Um, so possibly then overall 200,000 repatriate, but really very um, loose. And I, I, um, I, I think to me, what's important is that they're significant numbers and that they, these Polish Jews are the majority of Polish survivors, but I don't think we'll ever have an exact count. Uh, now there's, there are a lot of great questions. So I just pick one, you just uh, mentioned the word survivor. So the question is, how does this book change the idea of a survivor? I think that's a, important question. Yeah, it is an important question. Um, and the definition of, well, survivor itself is a relatively recent word. The, the people who lived through the war were DPs. Many of the people I study were called refugees. Um, then they went to other countries. They were refugees again. They, they were called many, many different names during the war and after the war. And the term survivor, kind of capital S, survivor of the Holocaust is only one really since the 1970s that's been in wide usage. And generally it has not been used to talk about these people, but I would say there has been, the term survivor has been broadening over the years. And that's partly because there are fewer survivors. And so the field and more popularly speaking groups like the kinder transport, people who got out of Germany relatively early are at the, the, the degree, the term survivor has come to encompass some of these groups um, who left early, for example. Um, and if you look on the webpage of Yad Vashem or the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum right now, these people fall under their definitions of survivor. It's really anyone who had to change their life because of the Nazi takeover even before the Nazis took over the land, the, just their taking over of Germany and then they're moving into parts of Europe meant that people's lives were inexorably changed. So th there isn't a one way to um, define the term. Um, and I, I think it is important that there, there are distinctions, of course. These people aren't, they, they didn't live in camps. They didn't survive the kind of 
complete and total anti-Semitism and dehumanizing that happened under German occupation. They didn't, they suffered, they, they died sometimes, but they were treated as people. Uh, they were treated a lot like Soviet citizens, not much worse um, during the war. And so they, they survived something. They for sure survived the war, but um, they didn't survive the Holocaust in the same way. And, and maybe we need another word for them or we need to have different sort of a tree within survivor of, of different types of survivors. Uh, yeah, this is unusual. Usually you just pick people asking questions and now I have to, <laughs> they're, they're interesting questions. Here's another one. Uh, to what extent do you think this book should, should uh, or will impact the way the Soviet Union is faulted or held accountable for the actions of Soviet officials? That's an interesting question. And it shows also it's a politicized territory we're on here. <laughs> yeah, and, and there's a lot of actually political issues that come up um, with um, Polish issues, uh, very much so, and Soviet ones uh, in the book also. But um, th this is a story of rescue to a certain degree. It, it's an accidental story of rescue, but these people survived because the Soviet Union didn't block them from coming in, didn't know exactly what to do with them, hoped they were gonna leave, um, turned out putting them, you know, deporting them to labor installations. It's not that they were treated well, but actually didn't force them to go back under German occupation. And um, I, I've tried to sort of use that argument to get a hold of some of the documents, some of the harder to reach documents about these people and, and to suggest to different archivists um, in the FSU that um, this is a positive story. It makes them look good. Why not show me those documents? But it hasn't worked yet. Um, but I, I do think it, it's a complicated story, um, but it does, um, in terms of the Soviet hierarchy, it's interesting. And it's also interesting to my mind and Anna pointed this out also just in terms of Soviet life. What was it like in the interior during the war which is an area that's gotten a lot more attention recently. Um, there's one very specific question which may be uh, by Barbara Krosner uh, about the ecology of memory. She didn't quite get that, uh, that was mentioned. Maybe could you explain that? Um, yeah, this is a, a wonderful term, which is not mine, but a, a scholar published a book a couple of years ago, um, which is called Ecologies of Memory, isn't it? Something like that. Um, but in which she says, Hannah Pauline Galai, that the language, the place, and the time in which people talked about their survival experience greatly affects the way they talk about it. So if they stayed in Lithuania in her particular study and um, spoke about their experiences in Yiddish, um, even though they might have had almost identical survival and wartime experience with, this, with someone who moved to the state of Israel after the war and then later talked about that experience in Hebrew, that they're going to use not just different terms, but actually a whole different sort of set of social beliefs in order to talk about those experiences, that they will have assimilated them into the place and the language and the time in which they live. And um, she's not the first person to think about those issues, but she put it in a really helpful way. And I would definitely recommend her work. Uh, here's another good question by Isabel Hedrick. Uh, the question, uh, what were the relations between the Polish Jewish refugees and Soviet Jews who often were refugees themselves? So she is referring to uh, Jews who fled from uh, Leningrad to Central Asia. So how did they, what happened on the ground? Did, are there any, is there any information you found? Yeah, um, uh, you know, just to sort of generalize, uh, there's a lot of different stories, but um, I found overall that the, the Polish Jews were deeply interested in Soviet Ashkenazi Jews. They wanted to know what had happened to them. Were they still, did they have the same customs anymore? Did they have the same beliefs anymore? How had the revolution changed them? Because they recognized that 
it's just a matter of a border. They could have also been Soviet Ashkenazi Jews, but they ended up being Polish ones instead. And so they felt a real camaraderie and interest kind of fascination, both particularly if they could meet ones who kept any aspects of traditional Jewish culture or who, who remembered Yiddish, they were just over the moon if people spoke to them in Yiddish. Um, whereas in Soviet sources and in writing by Soviet Jews and testimonies, I did not find much interest in the Polish Jews. It did not seem to be at least as remembered uh, quite reciprocal. And um, um, Isabel was talking about Ashkenazi Jews, those coming from say Leningrad, but there are also, of course, in Central Asia, there are local Jewish communities. And so these Polish Jews were also encountering Bukharan Jews and mountain Jews and Georgian Jews um, often for the first time with whom they had in many ways, nothing in common. <laughs> you know, this sort of idea of being Jewish in common and, and a language of prayer, but very little in common culturally or linguistically, um, a, a great distance in many ways. I have another, I think, really good question. Maybe that's the last question because there's so many. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I can only pick a few. Uh, do you think that there is a need or a way for this primarily or oral histor historical book to be proven through archival documents? And I think you, you touched on this a couple of times. So I think that's an interesting question, right? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm happy to, to answer that. And also in terms of other questions, I'm you know, happy to be in touch with people. And you can, my email is just era12 at psu.edu. I'm happy to continue talking with people. Um, but um, I, I'm a social historian, so I'm interested in how people live. And particularly what I became interested in the course of this study, and Kamil pointed this out, is how people make decisions. So those are the kind of elements of life that don't really appear in archival documents on the whole certainly not how people make decisions. It's, it's just not there. You just can't find it. So um, yes, one has to look to archival documents to show dates and that there were certain legal structures which affected the lives of these people. And I hope that I did include those. But what I was most interested in showing was how they lived, how they built their lives in these very difficult circumstances and how they made decisions about when because there were many sort of inflection points where they had to choose one way or the other. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that their oral testimonies don't reflect all of the difficulties of making those decisions and how much they put into those, but at least they give us something. They give us a way to um, delve into those questions. Okay, I'd say we uh, 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 end the uh, meeting here. So we uh, lost a couple of people. Um, so I think this is a good time. I'm very grateful to Eliana and very grateful to the commentators. Uh, and I just wanna uh, remind everybody who, uh, who's still listening, um, we will record or we are recording this uh, meeting. So if uh, somebody uh, could not listen in, You'll find it under the Penn State Jewish Studies uh, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, or Twitter page uh, uh, for a long time. So, uh, and please feel free to uh, contact Eliana. And of course, uh, uh, you can get the book now. It's now available in print uh, and actually published. Thank you so much uh, for listening. Thanks again. And thanks to our interpreters. Yes. <laughs>